speeches that was ever delivered by the best person who ever lived on earth, that was Jesus. And we call it the King's Speech, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, it goes by several different names, but this is the good news that Jesus came to offer this world. And he starts his good news by a word that's so, so welcoming, blessed. And the, and the meaning of blessed is happiness. Happiness is something we really all long for, deep within our hearts. The entire world, if there is one thing that nobody would deny, that is happiness. I just checked this morning, Pharrell Williams' song called what? You guys don't listen to those songs? Okay, I'm, I'm pagan and so I listen to it, but it touched a half a billion views. Can you believe that? You know, so it, it just shows the pulse of the modern world that we live in is that people long for happiness, they crave for happiness. And he, he goes in a song, as I said, you know, clap your hands if you know that happiness is the truth. Happiness is not the truth, but if you know the truth, you will discover true happiness. And that was what Jesus was coming to offer. How wonderful it is, isn't it? To a world that longs for happiness, Jesus says, I'm going to give it to you guys. And so he comes into this world and he says, I'm not just here to give you happiness. I'm here to actually establish a new kingdom, a new breed of kingdom, a kingdom that you have never seen before, a kingdom that you have never experienced before, a kingdom like no other kingdom on earth. And they were at that time under the dominion of Rome, which was literally ruling the entire world. So when Jesus says kingdom, people are thinking, this is going to be so cool. He's going to set us free and we're, he's going to do these fancy things. But he says, this is a new kind of a kingdom. And I'm going to create a new breed of people who are radically different from anyone who have ever seen. And I'm going to tell you how you can enter this kingdom and how you can live in this kingdom and what you can expect to be part of this kingdom. So what he says is, how can we enter into this kingdom? The first way he says you want to know how you can enter his kingdom to be these new disciples is when you come into this kingdom and when you come into this kingdom where I reign, where God reigns, this God who is holy and pure, the first thing you come to recognize when you enter this presence of a holy God is you start to see how dark your own heart is. And so it begins with being poor in your spirit. It shows the bankruptcy that we have, the moral bankruptcy that exists in our hearts, a poverty in spirit. And you know, it's radically different from what the world says. The world says, you want to be happy, just get that bigger house, get that bigger car, get that, you know, um, a better job and you'll be happy. But Jesus says the first begins with emptying yourself, emptying your inner self when you come into my presence and that begins with this uh, poverty in my spirit because that's what happens I mean when you enter into his presence and see the difference between him who is pure and you who are not pure and it doesn't stop there once you see your moral bankruptcy you then it creates a sort of a emotion a raw emotion of sadness and mourning you think really this is who I am I thought I was a nice guy I mean I'm not going around killing people or uh, you know doing bad things but you see, Jesus is actually looking into the attitudes, into the hearts. He's not defining religion as a set of external things. People don't like religion. Because religion is all about externals and, you know, putting up this facade. I'm better than you and I'm good. But Jesus is saying, I'm checking your heart. And, and, and the first thing you see once he shows, he gives you a reality check of who you are is, you're not that good. You look into your heart, you see what he defines as sin. Sin is defined as, you know, uh, this is a sports person. He's aiming for a mark, and every time he shoots, he falls short of that standard. And that standard is God's standard. And every time we try to not lie, try to not um, be um, coveting after other things, or anger, or whatever our unique situations are, and you fall, you feel bad. If you're true to yourself. So you, so it really, the, the second step in entering into the kingdom is you become sad about your spiritual step. And, and it doesn't stop there. Once you go through these first two things, it changes you as a person. You're no longer this haughty, proud, I am 
better than you guy going around telling people about all these great achievements you've made in life. The third thing that happens is you become meek. And that's, these are real changes. These are not intellectual, theological doctrines that you get loaded up into your brains. These are actual changes in a person who is gradually entering your kingdom. You can see yourself in this continuum and exactly know where you are. You know, being in a church or having been raised in a Christian home or a godly home or a religious home doesn't qualify you to automatically enter into this kingdom. Oh, I've been in church for 25 years in my life. I've memorized Sunday school verses. You know, I know the Holy Scriptures inside out. Sorry, no. Have you had these experiences in your life? And, and then when you're meek, uh, uh, it, it doesn't stop there. Now you are really looking for some light. You, you just, life can't just go on like that, can it? So now you start longing the next step. You start hungering and thirsting for something better, a better quality of life, a holiness, a righteousness. That's very different from what everybody tells. I mean, all religions are telling you, do this and this and this and you'll become good. Okay, you do this much bad, you try to do this much good, they kind of balance it out, and then you, you look good. But the problem is, you never know. So we keep doing good things, thinking that God will be happy and forget our bad things doesn't work that way, because Jesus says, I want you to show a holiness, a righteousness, that exceeds all these religious guys. He had some of the worst words for the religious fanatics, the Pharisees. He says, your righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees. Even if you are going to keep all the Ten Commandments, literally all the rules and the laws and everything, the holiness, the righteousness that you are going to show is just not enough because Jesus says he's come to give us a holiness, a righteousness apart from the law. It's far superior to that. So he, you begin to long for that. You're like, I, I want to actually be a better person in life. I really want it. And my religion is not helping me. My my, my, who I was is not helping me. You see, now when you come here is when you're actually inside the kingdom. Because now all you're longing for is not this uh, bigger house, bigger car, bigger job. All you're longing for is if only I can really be this better person, I can be inside this kingdom. How many of us have gone through these? And all of these are radically opposite to the world. The world says, blessed are those uh, who are proud. Blessed are those who are, um, you know, partying all the time. Blessed are those who are strong, who are aggressive go-getters. And blessed are those um, who are hungering and thirsting for pleasure. And then once you're inside the kingdom, you're now a new person. How does kingdom living look like? He says the first thing that happens to a kingdom living person is you become merciful. You know how, how bad you were. You, you start showing that mercy and kindness and grace when people hurt you, when, 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 when things don't go like you feel, like your spouses uh, pointing to you your um, bad attitudes, which never happens in our homes, right? You guys say yes or is that a no? Okay, you guys all have wonderful spouses, I think. My wife always tells me where I'm falling and what I'm doing, and I'm very grateful for that. But it, 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 you're able to now see you need the same amount, that person needs the same amount of mercy as you do. You change, you know. And, and you're not only just merciful to other people, what happens is now, you're actually experientially becoming better. Your, your heart is becoming purer because you, this God is, this Jesus has now started living inside your heart and he is living out through you. You're no longer living your life. It's Christ in you who is living and giving this new form of life. And it's so wonderful to cherish it effortlessly. And it's free, by the way. You can't pay yourself into it. You can't work yourself into it. Jesus says it's free. It's not cheap, though. And so you, you, you begin to have this pure heart, and now you're actually interested. Now that you've established peace with God, you actually want to see peace happen in the world around you. You're actually concerned about this world, and that's how his kingdom is expanding. You become peacemakers in the world. How wonderful it would be if the world is filled with these people. You know, all these atrocities that we are hearing about this hatred, these crude, nasty, brutalistic violence that's going on, and we see this in the news, 
How contrasting it is to this peacemaking life, this kingdom that Jesus is saying, I'm coming to give. You guys are going to be peacemakers. And the biggest peacemaker was Jesus himself. He actually died on the cross so there can be peace between us and God. And you would think if I am now inside this kingdom, and if this kingdom living is how I live, everyone should appreciate me and give me honors. But guess what you receive? And Jesus says, what you have to expect for that is, you're going to be hunted down. You're going to be persecuted because you're going to make people upset. Welcome to the new kingdom. That's the invitation from Jesus. It's, it's so high. Um, and it's, it's, um, it, it's, it, that's why it's a radically different kind of a kingdom. And it's not optional. You cannot have one food inside the kingdom and one food outside. You can't play this dancing around. You, you, you got to be in and, and, and God does that for us. God does it for us. So he, he goes around, he picks 12 very ordinary guys. They have nothing to brag about. And he says, these guys are going to be the first ones who are going to be these kingdom guys. I'm going to call them by a name called disciples. And by the way, it's not just going to be restricted to these 12 guys. I'm going to want all of you to become disciples like them. And actually, all these guys are going to die. And literally every single one of them was martyred for Christ. So he says, I'm going to create a new breed of disciples like them. You game for it? Are we game for it? You go around sharing this, you're not going to get a lot of people attracted to it. But the rewards, the, 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 that's, that's the blessedness he promises. And the word blessed comes from the word maher, which is like you can have the same, it's the sameness of God that's going to rub onto you when this Jesus comes and lives in your heart. And he doesn't stop there. He, he goes on to say, well, if you start being a kingdom man and woman, you're going to be the salt and the light of this world. You're not just going to sit inside the four walls of a place called church or home and, you know, be an ascetic or a monastic. You're going to be someone who stands out, stands apart. People are going to start watching you. And they're going to see something's different about this guy. In your home, your wife starts watching that first. Oh, you're a different man. How come you don't get angry these days anymore like you used to? Has it ever happened? And your children start seeing that difference. And then at your workplace, they start seeing a difference. Then your very work itself will change. You start questioning, why am I doing what am I doing? What is the value in this that I am doing? How can what I do make this world a better place? You start having those questions. You start wrestling with them. It messes up your mind, your life, everything up. And then he says, you'll be a salt and you'll be a city on a hill and, and you, you'll be so convicted of sin. You, you, if your eyes are causing you to sin, you'll want to gouge it out. If your hands are causing you to sin, you're going to want to take it out. And that's, that's really how you will become like a person. And then he realizes this is not an automatic thing. And, and what's, the, what's, the, what's the help that we can get so that these things become a reality and that's when he begins to talk about what are known as spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and living them out and giving. And that's where we find ourselves. So we need to have a context of what is it we're talking about. And as we're starting ourselves as a new face, as a church, it's, I think we can't, I couldn't think of anything better than prayer to be a theme to begin with. What is prayer? Why do we need prayer? And how to pray and how not to pray. And we saw how not to pray. So even, you don't pray because, by repeating your words, praying it like a, a mantra that you don't understand. Prayer is, is something you don't do to impress people. Or sometimes as we think we're impressing God by the words we use, it, it's really ridiculous. I mean, can we impress God? If you can even think about that, that's actually funny. You can't impress God because he knows your heart. And he says, how do you pray? You go pray in secret. He's not saying go find a secret room. He says, you pray. When you pray, you open your secret hearts, your deepest secrets. You're shameful to even share with others. You share it with God. You confess it. You help him to heal. You progress. And, and just be real with God. That's prayer. Prayer is just being real with God. And then he says, after saying how not to pray, he begins by saying, um, how to pray, and, and, and when he starts with how to pray, he speaks about the first object of uh, prayer and whom to pray. But this whole prayer is beautiful. You know, when he talks about prayer, 
It's just 72 words, very short, very concise. If you just say it, it'll be over in less than a minute. But it's a power-packed dynamite prayer. If we just And he doesn't say pray exactly these words. He, he says this is a model, a framework of how to pray. And he actually does it in his own life. And, 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 and the prayer that he prays is, is it's a prayer that begins with God. So very contrary to our prayers. Our prayers are need-based prayers. Our prayers are, are urgent, demand-based prayers. Something goes wrong in our work, our health, our life. We immediately, that's the only thing God comes to our mind and we go to pray. But he says, you want to pray, you start with God. Doesn't matter what crisis you're going through. When you start with big thoughts of God, it changes your prayer life. It's, it's, it does something amazing to you. So the first three petitions in this prayer are about God, God, God. Your name, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Is this how kind of we start our prayers? And then the next three or four are the ones that are really about our personal quests, our needs of how we want to pray. You know, prayer begins with God and his glory and his righteousness and it ends with God and his glory and his kingdom. And our needs are kind of sandwiched between them. That's a prayer that, that's, that, that can have an impact in our lives. And you know, in this, there are some beautiful relational dynamics throughout this prayer. If you see, when, when Jesus says, our father, as you begin, it talks about a father-child relationship. And when he talks about holy be your name, it talks about a God-worshipper relationship. And when he talks of your kingdom come, it talks about a king and a subject relationship. And when he says, your will be done, it talks about a master-slave relationship. And give us this day our daily bread, it talks about a benefactor-beneficiary relationship. And when he says, for Forgive us our debts. It talks about a savior sinner relationship. And when he talks about do not lead us into temptation, it talks about a guide and a pilgrim relationship. So it's a, it's a very, very relational prayer. And also it touches our emotions and various as Every phrase of this prayer touches various aspects of our emotions. When we say our, it, it reflects our unselfishness. When we talk about father, it kindles a fatherly devotion within us. When we, when we say hallowed be your name, it kindles a reverential attitude inside us. When we say your kingdom come, it, it shows a loyalty spirit within us for him. And when he says your will be done, it brings out our submissive attitude to God. And when we say, give us this day our daily bread, it brings out a dependent attitude for him. And when we say, forgive us our debts, it shows our repentant attitude to God. And when it says, do not lead us into temptation, it brings out a humil humility and a humble spirit before him. And when it says, yours is the kingdom, triumph and the glory, exaltation and forever, it leaves us ending with hope. Wow. What a myriad of emotions of a roller coaster ride you will go through if we really wrestle and mean every single aspect of this prayer. Have we ever experienced that in our lives? You know, Jesus always prays that way. And Paul prays the same way. And when he prays, for example, in Ephesians 3, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory... He prays the same prayer in Colossians. He, and when, so whenever he prays, he puts God first. And when Jesus prays, he prays all the time, Holy Father, Father. The only time he doesn't call God as Father is when he's on the cross, where he says, my God, my God, where have you forsaken me? And in every life situation, people's prayers have been the same. Job, at the end of his misery, he starts praying. His prayers become very different. He starts focusing on God's attributes. And the reason for that is before you talk to someone, you want to, you want to acknowledge that person for who he is. You want to make that person feel important and show them why they are important and why... They need to listen to you, and that's what God is seeking for in prayer. And so the object of prayer, prayer is our Father in heaven. 
He is the object of our prayer. You know, there is a, there's a nearness to it and a farness to it. Our Father makes it feel that, you know, God is so close to us. And heaven has, enables us to give him that reverence, that distance. And there are two aspects to God calling God our Father. In a, in a generic sense, in a creational sense, God is the Father of everyone in this world. But in a spiritual sense, not everybody are his children. In a spiritual sense, only those who have entered into the kingdom can actually pray this prayer. I went to a Catholic school uh, when I was young, Don Bosco, and we had to pray this prayer every day in the morning and in the evening before the school starts and after it ended. This prayer had absolutely no impact in my life. I, I've said this prayer a million times. But the time it began to make sense is when I had these experiences and actually became a kingdom man. So you see, if this prayer is not working for you, if this prayer is not doing something for you, the problem is not with the prayer, the problem is not with the order of it, the problem is probably who you are. And am I in the kingdom where I can call this God my Abba Father through Jesus? Because then he hears you, then you become his children, and he, and he starts listening to you. And, and, and for most of us, those of us who are fathers, we know we are not always perfect as fathers. We tend to get angry at times with our children, and sometimes our children, you know, really tell us, is this really the right thing you're doing? And as I shared with you, I, I didn't have a father, you know, because I lost him when I was very young, and I had a lot of anger and other things towards him. So I could never understand what does this our father mean? I don't like this father. Why would I want to call God as my father? But the soothing thing for me is to know this is our father who is in heaven. He is unlike any human father. He is, he is a holy father. And he is a father who is powerful. He knows everything. You know, he, he, he sees things from outside that we can't see within us. So when I go through a difficult time, I can go and tell him and pour my heart out to him. And he not only knows and listens, he can actually fix things, whether it's things in my own heart or whether it's things that are happening to me from outside. So that makes this prayer beautiful. And to know that he's my our father in heaven. And then we have these three divine uh, quests and, and three personal quests. And we're doing, going close with the first divine quest today. What is it that you want to ask God when you go to him in prayer? Hallowed be your name. That's the first divine quest. Hallowed be your name. You know, the problem is um, we think sometimes prayer is supposed to be the most a wonderful spiritual exercise that when we go to prayer, we think we're going to be in our best and this prayer is going to do something really good to us. But amazingly, prayer is the time where our worst can also surface. You know, this is what Martin Lloyd-Jones said about prayer. He said, we look at a drunkard, poor fellow, and we say there is sin. But that is not really the essence of sin. To have a real picture and understanding of sin, you must look at some great saint, some unusually devout and a holy man. Look at him there on his knees in the very presence of God. Even there, self is intruding itself and the temptation is for him to think about himself, to think pleasantly and pleasurably about himself and be really worshipping himself rather than God. That, not the other, he says, is the true picture of sin. If you really want to understand something about the nature of Satan and his activities, the thing is not to go to the dregs or the gutters or the horrible places out in the world. If you really want to know something about Satan, go away to that wilderness where our Lord spent 40 days and 40 nights. That's the true picture of Satan where you see him tempting even the very son of God. That's what makes prayer a very difficult, cumbersome exercise because we are battling at that point our own sinful self and Satan who is trying to take us. We read screw tape letters, Wormwood and screw tape exchange last week of how screw tape tells Wormwood, as long as this guy go to church, no problem. As long as he does any holy things, no problem. 
Just don't let him pray. Because that's when God starts listening and doing things. And things happen. How is our prayer life today? Have we, have we experienced this? So what does it mean to hallow God's name? What does it actually mean? I need to understand this. Just saying hallowed be your name doesn't do anything, does it? Well, the Greek word for hallow, it's kind of the same word that's used in being setting apart or making him holy. It says holy be your name. How do we make God holy? He's already holy. So how can I make him holy? Or how can I make him set apart? How can I make him stand apart? And it talks about name. What, what is his name? This is, is he saying, hallow be Jesus, or should I say Yahweh? You know, name is always connected with the character, the attribute of a person. You can only praise a person if you've known something special about that person that's made a difference in your life. And it's the same with God. You can say, I want to praise God only if I have experienced some of the special characteristics of God in my own life. So the way to hallow his name is first I need to experience him. And second I need to express him. How do I experience God's name in my life? You know for Israelites calling God as our father was not a normal thing. You know, they, they, there were analogies to that, but there was no direct calling him as a father. So when Jesus says, our father, they were like a bit taken aback. But the way God revealed to Israelites in a slow evolutionary way, starting from the time of Moses, and you know, it, it was always fear and awe. I mean, if he descended on a hill, you touch that, you die. But then slowly he came about, he, he gave them the sacrifices and all of that. And finally when Jesus came, he said, him who has seen me has seen the Father. Now we have a bigger picture of who God is and what he has done. So Israelites knew God first as their liberator from slavery when they came out of Egypt. So they could thank God for that. When they said, hallowed be your name, they would think about that experience. And then they, when they were in the desert, they saw God providing for them. So he became uh, the Jehovah Jireh. And then they saw God uh, being a redeemer for them when he instituted the sacrifices. So they came up with a lot of these Jehovah Nissi and Jehovah uh, Hitzedek and a lot of these names. Every single time something new happened to them, every single time some new experience of God they had, they added a name to describe this God. So what kind of experiences have we had with God in our life? Especially when we think about this kingdom living. Have we experienced God as a redeemer? It's wonderful to call God as someone who loves. Everybody believes that. And he does. He even loves his enemies because he gives them rain and sunshine. But if you want to have this special, closer relationship with him, we need to have this this kingdom living experience, him transcending us from this kingdom of this world into the kingdom of his light as not just our, our provider, not just our protector, but our savior. I was thinking, okay, if I were to paraphrase this prayer according to actually how we live and actually how we have known God, I was thinking what would our prayer look like? And what, what have we experienced from God? And what do we go to God for? We would say, I want to, uh, hallowed be the God who gives me bigger paychecks. Hallowed be the God who gives me better jobs. Hallowed be the God who gives me bigger homes and helps me drive faster cars. Hallowed be the God who gives me a lovely and a loving wife. Hallowed be the God who helps me to have happy, talented babies who can go to Ivy League schools. That's the kind of a God we kind of worship, don't we? But that's not how um, people worship him. Because when you, as soon as you enter into his presence, in a sense, the whole hallowing, it's, it's about God's holiness. You know, as soon as people went into his presence, they were struck by his holiness. You know, Job went through this horrible time in his life. His family was killed. He lost his property and all of those things God loved. But then when God finally shows up, he doesn't say anything except, you know, he repents and he retracts all his foolish things. And Isaiah, when he sees God, he says, woe is to me for I am ruined. 
And, and during the Lord's, Jesus' ministry, people came face to face with his power and holiness, and they were afraid when they saw him coming the storm. And David, in the, we can all relate to, he had these horrible experiences, but there was one word he kept repeatedly using again and again and again. In the Hebrew, it's kesed. There's no real literal translation for it. It's translated as faithfulness or grace. It's gracious, loving kindness. And so he, this God became very special. So whenever he would go to him, he would say, Oh God, you forgave me. You redeemed me. You gave me grace. You gave me a second chance. And I love you for that. So we need to first experience God before we can meaningfully pray this prayer of hallowed be your name. And how can we actually make God uh, be hallowed, express him? We want people to know how cool this God is because you have experienced it. You find a great deal on eBay, you, you start forwarding that out and start sharing it on Facebook. Now here's someone whom you've encountered in your life who's changed your heart and made your life so wonderful and livable and joyful you want to start letting people know who this God is, and that's living life on a mission. It's right here at the start of our prayer. Is that our heartbeat? And express people, express this God to those around us. And when we do these things, and when these things are our life's goals, and you start praying with these in mind, calling him as your father, when you, whether it's a tough time that you're going through in life, you know, whether it's, it's a job situation, people have let you down, they've hurt you, they've, uh, you know, you're being persecuted at your workplace, whatever it is. The moment you say, our father, it soothes your soul to you know, oh, now I'm in a safe place. Now, now I'm in the presence of someone who actually understands. And then you, you realize, what is it that is the most important thing? What is it that needs to happen in my life? The chief end of man is to know God and enjoy Him and glorify Him forever. So I just want to glorify God. And when I realize it's not about me, it's about what God wants to happen, all my problems take a back seat. And then I can start reconfiguring the way I want to live. And, and that's the reason why God actually says, start your prayers thinking about me and not about you. And then you start contemplating about what you've experienced about this God, and it brings back all those memories, these poignant times of encounters you have had. If you have had, it just revives your soul, and you're in an upbeat. Those prayers become special prayers. And how wonderful it would be to start every day with those prayers. And if we've just covered, you know, two lines in the Lord's Prayer, and, and if we just do this meaningfully, it changes our lives. And now is the pop quiz time. Well, we, had a, we, we, we spoke about, you know, how many days does it take to form a habit? 21 days. So how many of us have already started trying to find a buddy and start praying with it? Well, if you have not, don't worry. The first week was called grace period. <laughs> so we're going to restart the clock from today. Okay, so either if you already have someone whom you've been praying with, I'm going to close this by actually and going to encourage you to pray among yourselves. Find that buddy who you have and spend a couple of minutes. You pray the first line and they pray the second line based on what we've heard. And just pour out from your heart in your life and all those experiences. And if you don't have that, then the person next to you becomes your best buddy for this morning. So just stay with them. And, uh, and, and if you need prayers, feel free to come forward. You know... Uh, any of us here will be happy to pray. And let's take a couple of minutes to pray as the worship team uh, comes forward and gets ready to lead us in, in this song.